So how do businesses, you know, whether you're a startup or um, a big, you know, corporate or giant or just a small firm, like how do businesses um, use chat GPT, GPT-4 or any of the generative AI tools today? And I think that becomes the big question. And standing today, you know, if I were to give you advice, it would be you have to do five things and you cannot let any single one of these get dropped. And the first one is, I mean, if you first, I mean, I guess the, the meta is you have to start playing with it right away, you know, and that's the first step. You want to play, play, play. You want to build these sandboxes. Um, I guess the meta is if you don't start using it, you're going to get left behind because the efficiency, the um, productivity boost, the creativity boost, um, you know, tangent on the creativity boost there, you know, the creators, um, the people who code, who build stuff, who um, write articles, you know, like people like myself, we thought that we would be the last to get replaced. And the irony is that we might very well be the first. And that's the world we're living in today. So if you're anywhere close to making real things out of the world, whether it's a piece of article or a a piece of clothing or anything, anything that needs to be bought, um, then you have to be playing with uh, generative AI. So, and that's the first, like, that's the keyword play, because you don't want to have a set intention or a set goal. You want to become familiar with it. And the way you do this, though, you know, play for adults uh, has to be done with intentionality. And same is true for generative AI. You want to set up these sandbox. So you want to have a sandbox for somebody, for a team that says, um, you know, hey, this team should go be playing around creatively for marketing, for sales, for copywriting. You want to have a sandbox for strategy. How can we use this in business case development? In fact, right now I'm using ChatGPT in like five ways. It's sort of like expanded my team like fivefold. Is I have a business development manager. I have a, a social media strategist, I have a research analyst, and I have a creative director, you know? And so that's like incredible that I can have access to these powers, but the if I didn't set up these sandboxes, uh, I wouldn't know, or if I just focused it on like, you know, how do I minimize my losses or maximize profits? You're only seeing like one tiny, tiny, tiny aspect of this tool. Uh, so that's the first step, play. The second is super important. Don't trust it. You have to keep digging in, digging in, digging in. The set of questions, you know, the drug discovery example that I just walked through. Why are you saying this? What are your sources? Uh, And just asking questions. So when a smart person, let's say a consultant, walks into your firm and starts giving you suggestions on how to improve your business, well, he's an outsider and you would be skeptical. And that kind of skepticism is exactly what you need today. If you're building anything of consequence, anything of you know financial uh, or societal repercussions, you don't want to trust uh, ChatGPT or being um, any of the generative AI. You know, we all default to ChatGPT because it was the first one to come out, but really, it's true for any of the generative AI models out there. So that's sort of the second thing. I don't want to trust it. The third thing is you're going to see this um, expertise, like people who are, um, I guess, already shining in using generative AI are people who have uh, are building the expertise around prompt engineering. And you see this in, you know, if you just go to start playing around with ChatGPT, one of the first things you'll notice is that it is, it is somewhat interesting to mostly mediocre. And Yet, you know, you feel like, you know, there's a party happening somewhere out there and you're missing out. Like, surely this is more powerful than this, right? Uh, I'll give you an example. I was working on this talk for female geniuses in honor of um, um, Women's Day. And I was using it sort of as a co uh, talk co-creator. And I said, you are um, a speaking coach. I want you to act as, you know, a speaking coach who can tell me which of these um, talk topics or talk subtopics you want me to leave out. And I gave it sort of my summary. 
Uh, I gave it my title. I said, how can you make this more engaging? And it gave me back five things. Now, the interesting thing is I didn't pick any of those titles. Uh, and I instead came the mishmash and then some other inspiration um, using mine. And, you know, and you guys have the title in your hands, right? So it's, um, I think it's really interesting how you, by using prompt engineering, I gave a very simple example, but one of the features uh, they talked about in the demo that just came out for GPT-4 is you tell GPT, you say, I want you to act as tax GPT, or you are tax GPT. Here is the tax code. Here is the situation, you know, figure this out. Uh, so this prompt engineering becomes really, really important if you want it to act as anything remotely useful that can be actually used versus just sort of in the creative brainstorming mode. How do you bring it from uh, the war room into actual products, right? So prompt engineering, you want to start building expertise in it. But if you miss step one and step two, which is if you don't play with it first, mm -hmm. if you start trusting it right away, the prompt engineering, it doesn't matter, right? right. The technical detail, it's actually in one of the uh, technical papers that came out, is that with such large complexity, so GPT-4 has 100 trillion parameters, with so much complexity, a sort of emergence comes about. What it translates to is that there are these complicated math problems, and GPT was never really known for doing math no. well. Um, but at this level of you know, complexity, if you give it the right prompt, it can actually do the math problem. If you just give it the math problem and say, do this problem, it'll say, I am an AI language model, da 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 da, -da. <laughs> But if you give it the right prompts, surprisingly, it can solve the math problem. <laughs> so this prompt engineering becomes, you know, it's, it's a key pillar. A little anecdote, I guess I compare it to back in the days when Google was new and I guess all the way till up to five years ago when the algorithms worked differently and you could you know, find really cool or hidden information. Um, my team used to call me the Google queen because I could figure out the exact you know, phrase that exact search terms and that will give me access to these like, you know, corners of the universe, like whether it is like an email address of a billionaire or whatever, you know, whoever I wanted to get access to, whatever information I needed, I could, I could get it. Um, those skills became, you know, uh, irrelevant in the newer version of the algorithms in, uh, circa 2017. And mostly it's just sort of, you know, mediocre information now, sadly. Um, but this sort of like, you know, GPT kings and queens will emerge because they know the right set of input prompts mm. to deliver. So that's number three. Number four is you want to empower your AI. So you, by telling the AI, you know, this is really interesting, by telling the AI, this is called, the technical term for this is um, chain of thought reasoning. By telling the AI, show me how you arrived at these conclusions or show me how you come up with the answer. Not only can it actually solve certain problems that you thought it couldn't solve before, but it also gives you visibility into being able to uh, justify why or why not you should use that information. And this is really powerful. So empowering your AI to say, tell me how you can do this more responsibly, more safely, or walking me through the output. And the, you know, the classic example here is actually something they talked about in the demo for the tax GPT, where um, you know, they were talking about how he was trying to understand the tax code and to check if the math problem, you know, the, the, the answer is correct. And frankly, he had to use tax GPT's reasoning to help figure out how to figure out, you know, the standardized deduction because it was so complicated. So just simple ability to tell GPT, you know, uh, show me a chain of thought reasoning not only helps you get some visibility, uh, justifiability, but also helps the AI do it more responsibly. Um, what's mind blowing about all this is that, you know, even though it's AI, you would think that it's very good at logic, but there's numerous accounts and Reddit is flooded with them almost. And Gary Marcus talks a lot about this, is how you know, it's actually, it, it, it's not very good at logic. 
because it's not like a typical algorithm in the past. It's it's a predictive, you know, it's predicting the next word in the sentence. It's autofill on crack. It's what it is. So if you ask it things like, um, and this is I think one of the examples from Reddit. So if you put the bookmark uh, in a book at page forty one. Your friend comes and moves it to 65. You come back, where do you expect to find the bookmark? And it says, oh, it's wherever your friend put it, <laughs> right? Without, yeah, because it doesn't make these connections. And there's like so many different examples of this. And the last one, you know, we're talking about the five ways businesses should use it, is you want to tell the AI, like use the AI as a um, ethical advisor and this is really i mean this is this is uh again kind of strange you're harnessing the power of the ai to help it sort of self-regulate and to help you regulate because right now we don't have an fda for algorithms and we really need one if anything we have seen over the past few months is how quickly and crazily the tech giants can launch these things and test massive algorithms at scale. I mean, the fact that we do not have um, a gain of research type law in AI blows my mind. Because if you look at the safety documentation of GPT-4, they're talking about, they're testing whether this AI can escape, sort of, you know, Skynet style, Terminator style, can escape from the environment of GPT, get control of the internet, um, and get access to money and use it to self-replicate, gain power, obtain agency, and basically take over the world. There are teams that have actually been testing for this. And my question is, what would have happened if the test failed? <laughs> right? I mean, maybe it's failing in GPT-4, but what about GPT-5, GPT-6? And, you know, sure, you have a group of people and then a company called ARC that they're using to test these. Um, just because a limited group of people weren't able to figure out how to break this AI free doesn't mean that everyone in the world won't. And you know that's what people are going to try to do. It's just how the incentives and the internet and the world are set up. So whatever you launch as a business, you want to make sure, like, how can you ensure um, responsible, safe applications of this? And there's no good answer today, sadly, but it has to, one thing is clear, it has to come from your team and you can use the AI to help. So uh, the anthropic guys call this the uh, self morality code. Mm -hmm. And again, just simply prompting the AI to act as a responsible ethical agent um, can actually help it and you to figure out the ethical, moral, and responsible consequences of using this AI safely. 